have it on the screen here for you as well. We're going to go to 2 Samuel. We're in the Kings this morning. We're going to be in the Samuels tonight. 2 Samuel chapter 9. And we started a, a series on Sunday nights a while back uh, called Mission Impossible. And we've been looking through different accounts in Scripture where people, or groups of people even, are in impossible situations. And everybody else says there's no hope. And then, of course, Jesus steps in and provides hope. Uh, we're going to look in 2 Samuel chapter 9 at the mission or the case of the paralyzed prince uh, this evening. And what we're going to do is this. We're going to look at this, and this is not uh, Jesus stepping in. This is a man stepping in and providing hope in a hopeless situation. But as we read and we go through the outline tonight, I, and I, I try to do this as often as I can, uh, we'll, we'll parallel it to our lives today. And we're going to see that just like David provided some things for this guy, uh, Christ does the exact same thing for us, and it just, it just goes so well together as we look at this and we study it tonight. So uh, we'll be at that, 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 that topic this evening, the case of the paralyzed prince in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Everybody find that? I'll give you a second. All right, let's stand together out of respect for the reading of God's Word, and we're going to read the whole chapter. All right, it's only 13 verses, but uh, you say the whole chapter, and some people are like, what? <laughs> but uh, we'll look at all 13 verses tonight. And uh, start verse number 1, and David said... Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant, whose name uh, was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet uh, uh, any of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Maker, uh, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then king David uh, said and fetched him out of the house of Maker, uh, he, he, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, thy servant. And David said unto him, oh, sorry, I flipped that too quick. David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and all his house. Verse 10, now therefore, and thy sons and thy servants shall till, the land, uh, shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits, that thy master's son may have food to eat. And Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons. <laughs> you all got caught up on that. <laughs> Did you hear all the woes? Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Verse 11, then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. And let's pray together. Father, we thank you tonight for the time we've had to be in your house. Thank you for the service this morning and the baptisms and the celebration that we were able to uh, just worship you. And thank you for allowing us to be back tonight and to sing praise to your name, Lord, and again to, to hear a, a missionary update. And we're thankful for uh, this missionary family. We pray for continued blessings to them. And Father, as we uh, look into your word now tonight, we pray that you'll bless the preaching and the teaching this evening. Uh, may again just be helpful in, in, in our lives and may it challenge us and encourage us. And Lord, may we leave tonight thankful that we were here and uh, having uh, the word of God touch our hearts, we pray. We thank you again for all you've done and what you'll continue to do in our midst. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. There's a story told years ago. Uh, we have an outline. Sorry. You guys are going to get those. He's going to pass an outline around. If you want one, he, they're coming. Uh, I'll tell this story while they're coming with the outline. But the story is told about a man by the name of Fiorella LaGuardia. How many of you know him? Just Heidi. All right, very good. All right. He was the mayor of New York City. What? 
named an airport after him. You're exactly right. Uh, when he was go- uh, mayor of New York, uh, it was the worst days of the Depression and throughout all of World War II, he was the mayor. Uh, many people in New York called him Little Flower. And uh, he was only about five foot four, and he always wore a coronation on his lapel. So to give you a little bit about, a little bit about who he was. Um, obviously, I didn't, didn't know him. I was way too young, okay? To some, of you, some of you probably understand that. But uh, from what I understand, he was a very colorful character. He was not a mayor who sat in his office and did nothing. Uh, many times, uh, Charlie, he'd ride in New York when the fire trucks went in to, to, to salvage a building. He'd ride with them and be there at the fire to try to help people. Um, he made police raids with the police department. Uh, he would take an entire orphanage to baseball games. Uh, that's just who he was. Uh, whenever the New York newspapers would go on strike, which apparently was often, uh, he would go on the radio on Sundays and read the funny section to the kids. Uh, so, so he's a very colorful figure. One bitterly cold night in January in 1935, the mayor turned up at uh, night court, and uh, it served the poorest ward of the city. LaGuardia dismissed the judge and said, I'm going to take the bench this evening uh, so you can, you can have a break. Within a few minutes, a tattered old woman was brought before him, charged with stealing a loaf of bread. She told Mayor LaGuardia that her daughter's husband had left her, and uh, the daughter was sick, and both of her grandchildren were starving to death. That's why she stole the bread. The shopkeeper, who the bread was stolen from, refused to drop the charges. He said, it's real bad out here, Your Honor, and uh, she has got to be punished to teach others around here a lesson. LaGuardia sighed. He turned to the woman and said, Ma'am, I'm sorry, but I I do have to punish you. The law makes no exceptions. Ten dollars or ten days in jail. As he pronounced the sentence, the mayor was already reaching into his pocket He extracted a $10 bill and he put it into his famous sombrero and he said this, here is the $10 fine which I remit for you and furthermore, I'm going to charge everyone in this courtroom 50 cents for living in a town where a person has to steal bread so her grandkids can eat. Bailiff, go around and collect the fines from everyone. The poor little grandmother had her fine paid and left the courtroom with $47.50 in her pocket. 50 cents of that was contributed by the red-faced store owner who she had stolen the bread from. Around the courtroom, there were about 70 petty criminals, people charged with traffic violations, New York City policemen, all these types of people, and they had just paid their 50 cents. And for the privilege of doing so, the mayor got a standing ovation from even the criminals. I tell you that story, and I know it's funny. We're like, good for her, you know. But can I say this? That is the very essence of God's grace. John Newton wrote a song many years ago. We sing it to this day called Amazing Grace. Grace recognizes our wretched condition. It pays our debt. And then it leaves us with more in our pocket than we could ever have imagined. The passage we read today, I think, in Scripture is one of the clearest portraits of of amazing grace in the entire Scripture. God uses David and Mephibosheth to, to, to be a living canvas on which he paints. This is what grace looks like. In this text, David rescues a man from an impossible situation. This, this, this young boy, this prince that was crippled, had, had no help, had no future, had no hope. Yet God uses David to step in and change that and provide him and fix that impossible situation. And he uses it as a picture, I think, today for us to realize that's exactly what we were when we were lost in sin. And what Jesus did when he came to us in grace and shed his blood for, our, for our, our salvation. So as we look at this study of the paralyzed prince, it's really a case study in what grace looks like. And so I want to look at that tonight. So let's look at a couple of thoughts. Uh, I think I have three things here for you tonight. First of all, look at how grace is extended. How grace is extended. Uh, the story opens in the throne room of David in Jerusalem. David has it in his heart that he is going to extend grace to a, uh, a member of Saul's family. So as we think about that, let's look at, look, look at a couple of thoughts here. Look at, first of all, the reason for this grace. The reason for this grace, verse number one, David said he's going to show someone kindness, someone from Saul's family, kindness 
for Jonathan's sake. You know, I, I think about that and I think, how awesome is that? David did not have a good relationship with Saul, who he followed as king. David did not know Mephibosheth. Yet David chose to extend grace to Mephibosheth because of that awesome relationship he had with his father, Jonathan. Because David and Jonathan's hearts were knit together by the Lord and that friendship was, was stoked and that friendship was so wonderfully amazing, David says, I'm going to be kind to him because of this relationship. Can I just remind, this is not even in my notes tonight, okay? This is, this is, this is extra, this is a freebie, okay? Can I just remind us, it's okay to do good to somebody we don't know because somebody's been good to us. Okay? And I know we talk about blessing people this morning because God's blessed us. This is, that's, the, that's the very nature and the essence of grace. And David says, I'm going to be kind to him because of the relationship I had with Jonathan. That word kindness is also translated goodness, mercy, favor, loving kindness. In the Old Testament, it's the word grace. Grace is often defined as the unmerited love and favor of God toward the undeserving. See, we don't give grace to those who, who, who deserve it, do we? We give grace to those who don't deserve it. That's what grace is. Grace is one person accepting another person in a positive manner in spite of the unworthiness of the person being accepted. Think about that for a minute. Grace is God saying, you're a dirty snake, but I love you anyways, and I'm going to accept you, and I'm going to bring you into the fold. I don't deserve it. I'm unworthy of it. David's desire was to extend grace to a member of Saul's family. And it's really kind of amazing because if you think about it, most kings would not have done that. The, the tradition of most kings was this. I'll annihilate the family that came, if it wasn't family, obviously, you know, a succession of a father and son. I'll annihilate the king's family before me so none of them rise up and try to take the throne. Uh, that's what I would do. So, so many ancient kings totally eradicated the family of their predecessor so that no claim for the throne could be made. There was a king in, uh, in, in Assyria. Ash, Asher Banapal was his name, if I say that right. I don't know if I am, but he, he, he was so bent on this, making sure nobody would rise to power from the pre previous king. He executed and fed the bodies of, 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 the, of the former king's kids to the dogs as his first official act as king of Syria. <laughs> okay, so that's the, that's the, that's the thing. Now, what, what he did was what people would say, well, that was justice. He, they deserved that because he, he was taking the throne and they, you know, we couldn't have that, 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 uh, that, that problem there with the family. What David did was grace. Grace. He had the right to execute judgment, yet he chose not to and instead to demonstrate grace. Now, again, David did this not because the house of Saul deserved it. Uh, he did it, number one, because of his relationship with Jonathan. Uh, they were closer than brothers. Their souls were knit together. He did it, number two, because of, uh, of, of uh, promises he had made many years before. David had promised Saul and Jonathan years before in 1 Samuel chapter 20 and 24 that he would not destroy their offspring. So he's keeping his promise as well. So this grace is extended, but here's the other thing. It's extended because of another person. David did not show grace to Mephibosheth because of Mephibosheth. That word gets hard to say if you start saying his name real quickly, okay? I'm, gonna call him, I'm just going to call him Mo, okay? But uh, <laughs> he didn't extend grace on, on behalf of, he extended grace on behalf of another person, Jonathan. Jonathan. You know, God also extends his grace to us. The descendants of Adam. We do not deserve his grace. We don't deserve his love and his mercy. We deserve judgment. We deserve punishment in a place called hell, okay? The wages of sin is death. We deserve that. But God extends his amazing grace to us, not on our behalf. He extends his grace to us on behalf of another, his son, Jesus Christ. His son, Jesus Christ. He loves his son so much that, 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 that the whole process of salvation by Jesus dying on the cross took place. So we have nothing that merits us to God. But because of Jesus, we can experience God's amazing grace. Isn't that awesome? I, I don't know, I start talking about grace tonight, I might, I might, I might dance a jig, I'm not sure, just, if I do, just, I'm just warning you ahead of time, okay? This is grace. So the reason is not because he deserved it, the reason was because it was on behalf of another, and, and nobody deserves it. Secondly, look at the reach of this grace. The reach of this grace, verse number one, he excites to send grace, and he says, is there any left of the house of Saul? Again, house of Saul was his predecessor, his bitter enemy. It didn't matter. David places no limits on his grace. He's willing to extend it to any member 
of the family of Saul. You know, this is awesome because here's the thing. David was not looking for somebody who met a certain criteria. David was not saying, I'll extend grace to this guy if he'll be a good soldier in my army. I, I'll extend grace to this guy if he's an intellectual and so he's smart enough to help me in my kingdom. There was no criteria. He was not looking for people who had certain abilities. He used the word any, which means any. <laughs> any person who was a family of Saul was a candidate for David to say, I'll extend grace to you. That, that's, a pretty, that's a mighty broad reach, isn't it? It wasn't specific. Do you realize that God's grace knows no boundaries? No boundaries. He extends his grace to all people. For God so loved the world. Regardless of our past. Amen. Regardless of our, of our race. Regardless of our social standing. Regardless of our financial situation. Regardless of our deeds. He extends grace to anyone who will receive him. God does not reach out to save the righteous, but the sinner. That's God's amazing grace. The reach of his grace for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Boy, here, here's the thing. If a person has never been saved today, they're a candidate for God's grace. They're a candidate for God's grace. He'll save anyone who will come to him. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 talks about uh, Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus in chapter 2. and talks a little bit about our condition and what we look like. He uses words like we're dead, and we're deceived, and we're depraved, and we're doomed. We're, we're bad people on the way to eternal damnation. Uh, sadly, the truth today is many people don't even see themselves as sinners. I've, I've, I've witnessed to somebody who I couldn't get to admit that they've committed sin, and if you can't admit that you're a sinner, you don't need a Savior. <laughs> so there are people like that today. But you know, if you think about it, if you look at life, itself it it's pretty much speaks to the facts that we're all sinners we've all done something wrong where Mephibosheth was when David found him I want you to notice this he was in the house of Maker uh, Maker is a place in, in, in a place called Lodabar Lodabar was the town name both the house he was in and the name of the city he was in describe his condition Maker means sold Lodabar means no pasture nowhere to go Stuck here. <laughs> I've been sold. <laughs> I have no hope. You all with me? This is impossible. There's nothing for me. Both the place and the house describe his condition. He's a man who'd been injured in a fall. His condition was not his own fault. He's the son of royalty, yet he's crippled and unable to seek or get to the king. He is separated. He's in hiding and afraid. And by the way, his name, Mephibosheth, means shameful. This dude's got three strikes against him. <laughs> All right, he's in a bad situation. He's in a hopeless case. He's helpless to do anything about it. Can I just say again, what a picture of the lost sinner. Do you realize before we came to Christ, we were just like Mephibosheth? We were sold uh, to, to, to sin. We were sold as a slave to the bonds of, uh, of Satan. We had no pasture. We had no hope. We were shameful. You, you get all this, how well it works into our lives. There was, uh, you know, before we were saved, there was no one to hear us when we prayed, unless it was the prayer for salvation. There was no one to help us to shoulder our burdens in life. There was no one to turn to in the dark hours of the day when we were struggling. There was no help for today and no hope for tomorrow. Before we knew Christ, uh, Jesus, anyone outside of God's grace finds themselves saved. I praise the name of God. I praise the name of Jesus that he extends his grace to everyone who's in that condition. And after seeing our condition in Ephesians chapter 2 as, as dead and deceived and doomed and all that, Ephesians 2, 4 opens with this phrase, but God, but God, who is rich in mercy. Come on, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? How's that? Can you hear me now? All right, let's start back at the beginning. <laughs> Why are you all leaving? Get back in here. I was <laughs> but God, but God, that's the reach of his grace. His salvation is available to whosoever will. Uh, there are no limits on who can come to God, how many can come to God. Grace is extended to all who will. Think about it. You're a descendant of Adam by your first birth. You cannot control that. You're a candidate for salvation for the second birth. We all are. 
Uh, and by the way, John chapter 6 tells us if we come to him, he will no wise cast us out. He will, not, he will not turn us away. God's amazing grace is how we got saved. God's amazing grace is what changed our life. And it's available for everyone. That's the reach of grace. Look at the response of this grace. The response of this grace. David discovers one of Jonathan's sons is still living. He hears the news that it's a little crippled boy down at Lodabar. Here, here's, here's the thing about this grace. Here's the response of David's grace. He did not ask, well, what, what kind of guy is this? How bad crippled is he? Does, is, 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 he is he a good person? He doesn't ask any of that. Grace says this, I'm not concerned with his background, his surroundings, his ability, his appearance, his future potential. I'm going to extend him grace, period. The response of grace was this. There's a little crippled boy, and David's response was this. Where is he? Where is he? There's only one. Where is he? Where is he? I want to get to him. David hears where he is, and he says, go fetch him. I love, don't, you love, don't you love common words that are used in Scripture? Go fetch him. How many of your parents used to tell that? Go fetch a pail of water. I know some of you are old enough for that. Amen. Go fetch a pail of water. Ride your bike down to the store and fetch a, uh, one of them five-cent loaf of bread, right? <laughs> Back in the day, right? He, he said, where is he? That was his immediate response. Not, what, what's he like? Is he going to be an asset to me? Is he going to be a burden? for? No, he said, what's, where is he? And then he says, go fetch him. Go fetch him. Grace said, I'm not concerned about his condition I want him just like he is. I'll take him just like he is. Isn't that the amazing grace of God? Because here's the thing. I, I don't have to clean myself up to be accepted by God. I accept the amazing grace of God, and God does the cleaning up. <laughs> God does all that. Uh, he does not look upon us and, well, I'm concerned with the spiritual uh, crippled condition of this young man. No, God says, you know what? I see him through the eyes of grace. I know exactly what he is, but I also know exactly what he can be if he accepts me. He loves us in spite of who we are. Amen? He knows about our past. He knows about our problems. He also knows about our future potential. And he draws us to himself. Isn't it nice that Jesus fetches us? <laughs> he draws us to the Father. Do you remember? You remember the day you got fetched? I remember as clear as, as clear as the day. I remember, I, I can tell you everything that happened. I, don't, I, I, I can tell you where, I can take you to the place right now. I could fly you to Indiana, drive you into my hometown, and I could take you to the place where it happened. Okay? Now, the same building's not there, but I still know the corner. Okay? You remember when you got fetched? <laughs> Aren't you thankful he fetched you? I know I am. I didn't deserve it. That was the grace of God. The grace of God. You know, no wonder, no wonder John Newton wrote Amazing Grace. I don't know. The, is there a word to describe it? I don't think we have it in our, in our English language. Amazing Grace. How grace is extended. Without the grace of God in our lives, we'd all be lost for eternity. I'm thankful he doesn't look at our past. Amen? And hold that against us. He says, it's, that's under the blood once you've accepted me. He looks at our future. And he sees us, uh, God sees us through the lens of Jesus Christ. When we accept Him as our Savior. That's the response of grace. That's how grace is extended. Look at number two. Look at how grace is embraced. How grace is embraced. For just a moment, this may sound weird because he was a crippled boy, but for just a moment I want you to put yourself in the shoes of Mephibosheth. The wheelchair of Mephibosheth. However you want to think about it. You are one of the only remaining members of King Saul's family. You are living in a place called Lodabar, which means no pasture, and you're hiding. That's why you're there. You're helpless. Your life is hopeless. You're poor. You're crippled. You have been since you were five years old. When he was five, his father was killed in battle. He was, uh, the terrible news came. Mephibosheth was being picked up by a, a nurse, and she took off running with him and fell and damaged his legs. Since the age of five, all of his life since five years old, he'd been warned. There's a new king coming. Your grandpa didn't like him so much. He's probably going to seek you out. and He's probably going to kill you. Now, think about it. You're already in a hopeless situation. 
Nothing is going for you, <laughs> all right? You, you, you got no breaks in life, if you want to say it that way. Everything's against you. you. This is hopeless, and now you're being told your whole life, oh, by the way, the new king's probably going to hunt you down. You don't have access to the wealth or the lands of your family. They've been taken. You've been warned David is coming for you, and then one day you're sitting at your home in Lodabar, and you hear the sound of horses and chariots. You hear men enter the king, and you hear your name. He's looking for Mephibosheth. They load him up. They take him from his home to see the king, just like he had always feared would happen. The chariots arrive at the king's palace. Mephibosheth is carried into the king's presence, and when he arrives there, nothing is like he imagined it. Instead of Mephibosheth being entered into the king's presence for a death sentence, he is entered in to the very presence of grace. He is not told, I'll kill you so that you don't take the throne. He is told, I'm going to make you family. I'm going to make you like one of my own. I want you to see how he embraces it. Verse number 6, he embraces it with a humble heart. He falls on his face and does reverence to David. He comes into David's presence. He's aware that he, as a descendant of Saul, David could execute judgment upon him. And he humbles himself in the presence of David. You realize, I'm just going to say this. You know, we, because we don't deserve grace, when we, have, when we have it extended to us, we ought to accept it humbly. There, there, there are too many Christians today walking around with a chip on their shoulders thinking, well, God's lucky to have me on his team. Hogwash, baloney. God doesn't need me, period, okay? <laughs> He uses me, and I'm thankful for that. But he doesn't need me. Accept grace with a humble heart. Well, I deserve that. No, if we got what we deserved, we'd be in hell. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Accept it with a humble heart. Mephibosheth did. He embraces it, secondly, with a happy heart. Verse 6, going into verse number 7, instead of judgment, Mephibosheth experiences tenderness. You know, think about what David could have said. Think of what David could have done. Yet I believe, I believe that when David saw Mephibosheth, he saw Jonathan. And you know, that's, that's, that's the grace of God. When God sees me, he sees Christ. That's, that's my identity. Now, I want us to understand that we, we have so many Christians running around like chickens with their head cut off. Not, not headless Mike, the, the living chicken, but... Running around with chickens with a head cut off, trying to figure out, well, where's my identity? Where am I found? Who, what, how, do I, how, how do people look? Hey, my identity is not in me. It's in Jesus Christ. And the grace that God bestows is because when he sees me, he sees his son. He sees his son. This is, this is what we, the, the big word we use in Scripture. Uh, scripture. scripture. Apparently, Scripture is a hard word for me tonight. This is the imputation. God does not look at my filthy, wicked, sinnerful self, and instead he looks at the the shed blood of Jesus Christ that has been applied, and he says, hey, I see Jesus. I see Christ. He hears David call his name, and to his amazement, David speaks peace to him. He hears the king promise restoration of all the wealth and all the lands and all the glory that once belonged to the family of Saul, and he says, that is Mephibosheth's now. I'm giving it back. Then the icing on the cake. I like cake. The icing on the cake is this. David promises Mephibosheth a place at the king's table. Now, I don't know about you because I've never been in a, in a palace with a king, but uh, I've, I've seen some on TV. You know what I've always noticed when the king eats? He's got the good stuff. He ain't eating okra. Come on, this is twice in one Sunday. Some of y'all need to get some conviction about this, all right? <laughs> he ain't eating okra. He's got, the, he's got the big old turkey leg, you know, he's pulled off. <laughs> you know? He's got the feast and the bounty. And he says to Mephibosheth, we don't know each other yet, but because of Jonathan, you got a place at my table always. And with a happy heart, I think Mephibosheth said, what? I'll take that. I'll take that. He embraces it with a humble heart, with a happy heart. I think Mephibosheth embraces it with an honest heart. By the way, when I accept God's grace, it ought to be in humility. Amen? And boy, I'll tell you what, it ought to make me happy. (laughs) 
Amen. But there's some honesty involved as well. Mephibosheth is overwhelmed by the grace he's received, and he acknowledges as such, and he acknowledges, I can't believe I'm going to you know, get this love and this mercy. Grace has been extended uh, for, and nothing in Mephibosheth's life would ever be the same. What a picture of the lost sinner who encounters the grace of God. When the king calls us, it's a, it's a moment maybe of fear in our hearts brought about by conviction. The sinner knows, I deserve nothing but judgment. I deserve nothing but separation from God. By the way, there has to be some conviction for salvation to be, to be you know, brought upon, okay? I've got to feel that I've done wrong. I've got to feel that I've sinned. I've got to know that. The call of God comes, and when the sinner responds to the call of God, he's ushered into the presence of the king of kings, and, and we ought to fall down in humility and reverence before him in worship like, like Mephibosheth did. And as the king speaks, he reveals to us the truth that grace has turned away his wrath. What we really deserved, because of his open heart and because of what his son has done for us, he will not give us what we really deserve. And instead, in grace, he'll give us what, what we need, which is heaven, which is a, 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 our sins forgiven, which is a, a family of God. Well, if you've experienced God's saving grace in your life, you know how overwhelming it truly is. I, I often say this, and I'll, and I'll, I'll keep saying this until, until I die, okay? There ought to be times in your life where you sit and do nothing but dwell on the day that you got saved and what Jesus Christ did for you and the change that he made and the blessings of God upon salvation. And you all just spend time and have a little fit about it every now and then. Yeah, I know, you're Baptist. We don't do that. You ought, you ought, you ought to be ex-Baptist for a little bit, amen? Get you, get you some Baptocostal blood running, running through you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> it ought to motivate you <laughs> to, to honestly before God say, hey, I didn't deserve it and you gave it to me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Wonderful, matchless, glorious Savior that we have. His, his grace has embraced so many changes in our life. And if you think about it, our life will never be the same after experiencing the grace of God. Uh, that's why it's called amazing. Amen. That's, grace is extended. We see how grace is embraced. Let me get this last thought. Look how grace is expanded. Look how grace is expanded. When Mephibosheth comes to David, he did not get what he deserved. He received grace. When he received grace, he also received more blessings than he ever could have imagined. Grace was expanded. It wasn't just, I won't kill you. It was a whole bunch more. Notice what grace provided to Mephibosheth and what saving grace provides to you and me. First of all, grace provided a future. Where was he? Lodabar. Past, no pasture. Living and hiding. No hope. Nothing around him. No, hey, look, come and visit me in Lodabar. The travel agents are saying, don't go to Lodabar. They're, they're, we don't fly into Lodabar. <laughs> okay, it ain't, you ain't renting a car and there are no taxis going to Lodabar. There, there's no door dash in Lodabar, all right? Don't go there, all right? Uh, stay away. <laughs> That's where he was. He's a fugitive, thinking, you know, David's coming for me. I got to hide. Uh, no, no blessings in his life. Yet grace is then extended to him. He has no, no hope of a future, really. And he meets grace, and everything changes. Uh, all of his present needs are met, and all his future was secured through a one-time action of David, which is extending of grace. Grace gave Mephibosheth something he never could have had in Lodabar, a future. A future. Grace gave him the plenty of the king. Grace gave him the, the opportunity to sit at the king's table. Grace gave him peace with the king. This one man's encounter with grace affected his whole family. Uh, all of them were, were delivered. The rest of, uh, of uh, Mephibosheth's family were brought from Lodabar into the presence of the king. Mephibosheth was expected to always eat at the king's table. This wasn't a, hey, once a month I'll let you fit, uh, dine with us. He said, I want you always at my table. It was an open invitation. He had access to the king. Now stop for just a minute and think about what grace did for us when we got saved. We have access to the king. We're invited to his table, amen? We have a future which we did not have before. I don't care how much money the lost person makes. I don't care how far up he rises up in his company. I don't care how much popularity and power he has. He has no future without Christ. And when Christ saves us and we meet that amazing grace, all of our eternity changes and we finally have hope for the future. We had no future, now we're promised security. We had no home of his own, now we have a home in heaven that God is preparing for us right now. We had no hope, now we're promised in Scripture to have all of our needs met. That's our God, that's amazing grace. We had no one to love us, now we have the presence of Jehovah in our life. 
who loves us so much he gave his son for us. I used to be a nobody headed to hell. Now, by grace, I'm a somebody headed to heaven. That's the grace of God. That's what grace gives to all those grace. See, it's not just a little bit, well, you don't have this. It's, hey, I won't give you this, and I'm going to give you all this on top of it. It's like, you ever, you ever, you ever make your own ice cream sundae? We didn't have ice cream Sunday at church Sunday. We need to do that. Just like after a service meeting, go to Fellowship Hall and have an ice cream Sunday. What do you think? Y'all think about that? I wish I knew somebody who could get us ice cream. Is there anybody that might be able to get us ice cream? But I don't know about you. If I'm going to make my own ice cream Sunday, you know what I'm not, you know not going to do? I'm not going to put a scoop of vanilla on there and then say, okay, let me have just a little dab of chocolate, a little dab of butterscotch. A little dab of caramel and a little dollop of whipped cream. I still don't know what a dollop is. A little dollop of whipped cream. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to load that bowl so full that as I'm walking to my table, it's falling out the sides. I'm going to put every topping on it that I like. I'm going to load. You ever been to one of them yogurt stores where you put your own toppings on it? And then if you come in, it weighs a certain weight. It's free. I look at that and I say, eight ounces? I'm loading this bowl up with like 36, man. I ain't even trying to win it for free. I'm going to have 36 ounces in this cup. That's my goal, all right? I'm going to triple your weight. That's what I'm going to do. I'm like, load it up. <laughs> load it up. You go to the old Benson ice cream shop, and you get, a, you get a, a, a vanilla ice cream, and you get some maple syrup on the top loaded with hot, juicy, yummy bacon. And you know what you say? More bacon, please. Oh, could you give me a little less? No, I want more. Mephibosheth isn't complaining for what David did. He, he, got his, he got his future secured and so much more. You realize that's the grace of God? He loaded us up so much. It's like that, that Sunday that's overflowing. Grace provided a future. Look at this. Grace provided a family. Mephibosheth was adopted out of Saul's family into David's family. Grace gave him something he did not have before. as expanded to him. Grace gave him a family every day he lived. He was reminded by his surroundings, by the presence of the king himself, that he was a recipient of grace. He was there because of the grace of the king. David claimed him as a son. Grace took Mephibosheth out of death and brought him into life. You realize it's the same thing with salvation? When we experience the grace of God, we, we respond to the call of grace, that sinner is immediately adopted into the family of God. He is taken out of Adam and he's placed into Christ. Uh, in Adam we were doomed to die. In Christ we're destined for eternal life in heaven. Grace took us from Lodabar and put us in the family of God. Never forget where we are and what we have because of the grace of God. We have a family. We have a family. We have a family in heaven. You know what? He's given us a family on earth. Amen. We have brothers and sisters in Christ. And we have a church family that, that God has brought us and made us a part of. That's because of grace. He provided a family. Let, let me give you this last thing. I think it's the last thing. I don't have your outline in front of me. I think it is. Grace provided fulfillment. Grace provided fulfillment. Mephibosheth was a nobody in a house full of somebodies. I want you to imagine a scene for just a moment. It's supper time at David's palace. The royal family enters the dining hall and takes their places at the king's table. King David is sitting there. Absalom, the perfect and handsome son, sitting there. David's other sons, royalty, sitting there. David's beautiful wife and his other wife and his other wife and his other wife and all of his beautiful daughters sitting there. Joab, the captain of the guard, the proud general who served David well, sitting there. Princes and princesses, soldiers and statesmen, men of wealth, men of decree, men of power. They all take their place around the table of King David. But just wait a minute. As the family gathers down the hall, there's a sound of a crippled man coming. You can hear the clump of his crutches, the sound of his feet being dragged. And in comes Mephibosheth. He's not royal, but there's a place for him at the king's table with all the rights and all the privileges of the royal family sitting around. And when he takes his seat, 
The tablecloth falls and covers his legs, and he looks just like everyone else. You realize because of the grace of David, Mephibosheth belonged at the table. You know, grace took a nobody from nowhere, and it made us a child of the king. Rich people are no better than me. Wise people are no better than me. Powerful people are no better than me. See, in God's eyes, as I sit at the, ta- at the, at the king's table, the tablecloth falls, and we're all the same. And when God sees us, He sees the unconditional love of His Son. And Mephibosheth knew, I'm a nobody amongst a bunch of somebodies. But because of God's grace, I'm a somebody too. You you realize tonight that's the grace of our God? It takes a nobody and it makes us a somebody. It takes a lost sinner and it changes him completely. And it gives him a seat at the Lord's table. It takes us from Lodabar and makes us a child of the King. It puts us on even footing with all the breath of God's other precious saints. Because of God's grace, I belong exactly where He places me. When He fetched me, I was embraced by grace and I was saved and God elevated me to a new position. You know, think about this. You realize tonight as a child of God, you're not beneath Abraham. You're not beneath Noah. You're not beneath David. You're not beneath the Apostle Paul or any other saint in Scripture you want to mention. I'm a child of God. I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ because of grace. It fulfills me. I'm seated at the table. All my infirmities are looked over. That's the power of grace. When Mephibosheth was adopted, I want you to notice something. I'm I'm finished here. Verse number 3, the chapter starts and it says, it talks about Mephibosheth and it says he was lame on his feet. Verse number 13, after he's been adopted and shown grace by David, he's in the king's family. Verse 13 reminds us he's still lame on both feet. He was still a cripple, but he was accepted and welcomed at the king's table. You know, I thought about that and I couldn't help but think. How many times do I, who has been accepted now because of the grace that God has bestowed upon me, how many times do I still mess up? I still fail. I'm still a crippled little scumbag before God. And yet God says this. God says this. I still forgive. I still see Christ. And you're still welcome at my table. That's the grace of God. I'm still His son. I'm always welcomed at the table. That is is grace has nothing to do with me has nothing to do with how great I am it's the grace of God you know I thank God this evening for his life changing soul saving grace all we can do is call it amazing boy if you've been fetched by grace you've seen the power and the promises and the provisions of God in your heart and in your life if you're saved tonight you you understand this whole thing of grace well, if you don't know Christ, I'm glad that you can come to him at any, at any, at any minute when he, when he calls. I'm glad that he accepts anyone who will come to him. If you're not saved, hey, you need fetching, amen? <laughs> and I'm glad he'll fetch you. If you are saved, you done been fetched. The question I would ask, though, is this. Am I walking with the Lord the way I should be? And even if I'm not, I can get that right and be restored to a place of fellowship with him. If I'm saved tonight, which I am, am I thankful I've been fetched by grace? Do I praise Him often for it? Do I realize how hopeless my situation was? And without the grace of God, my impossible situation will remain impossible. I'm I'm thankful again tonight as we close every lesson that because of grace, the mission of the lost sinner, the mission of the paralyzed prince is complete because of the grace of God. Well, I'm so thankful for the grace of God tonight. I'm thankful that David and Mephibosheth give us such a clear picture of God's amazing grace in the life uh, of a sinner as we become his child. Next week, we'll look at 1 Kings 17. We're going to be in Kings again. The, oh, I love this one. The mission of the supernatural smorgasbord. Now, how many of you know what a smorgasbord is? Wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. You guys know what a smorgasbord is? You guys don't. You're too young. <laughs> they got rid of smorgasbords, you know, and now it's uh, buffets and, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, smorgasbord. Um, there was one in the Midwest, 
that my grandpa just loved. It was like heaven on earth. Duff's, Duff, Duffy's, I think it was called, Duffy's Smorgasbord. And we would go there every time we were with grandpa, and then they closed their doors, and my grandpa was the most miserable person on earth afterwards. He was so bitter and upset about that. But uh, Smorgasbord, that's, that means there's a lot of food, Amen. So we'll we'll talk about that. Maybe we'll bring some. I'm going to bring some props for next week. We want to bring some. <laughs> we might as well, right? Uh, anyways, that's where we'll be next week in First Kings chapter 17. We have our blanks filled in tonight. Any thoughts, comments, questions? If not, we'll pray and go home. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your amazing grace, and we're thankful for the love and the mercy that you show us. And Lord, what a beautiful, beautiful picture in the Old Testament here of David and Mephibosheth. And Lord, we're so thankful that we can claim the truths of this passage and this scripture and uh, claim your grace in our lives. We're thankful that when you see us, you see Jesus Christ applied to our lives. And Lord, I pray that we'll never forget that. I pray that we'll be thankful and often give you thanks and praise and reverence uh, you, Lord, and worship you because of your grace. Father, I ask you now as uh, we go to our homes tonight, just give us safety, please, as we travel. We ask you to bless this week, Lord, as the ladies prepare for their uh, ladies' uh, banquet here coming up on Saturday. We pray that you'll bless that. Uh, Bring us back this midweek, Lord, as we uh, meet together. We pray and we fellowship. We sing. We uh, open your word again, Lord, and continue our study in Esther. We pray that you'll bless that as well. And, Lord, we just ask you to be with us uh, the remainder of this week now. May, again, we live for you, point people to the Savior. And do our best, Lord, to uh, be thankful for your grace and, and as well as to share that with others, I pray. Uh, again, Father, we thank you for all that you do. Thank you for today in the services. And we ask you to bless us now the remainder of this week. We ask these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. Goodbye. God bless you. Shake a hand or two on your way out. And we will look forward to seeing you on Wednesday.